Hello everyone! It's Friday, finally, that time of the week, my favourite time of the week. We get to go through um, all our wonderful new record releases of the week. We're going to dive into some newspapers today as well. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be joining you. Um, I am joining you from sunny uh, Suffolk today. Um, and oh, just, uh, we've, we've had a great week here actually. It's been uh, super, super, um, we've had a super historic week. Um, a new mosaic has been discovered um, in the shadow of the Shard, which is just behind me. Um, we've got the lovely Jesse in the comments in today, uh, so please do uh, say hello. Our question of the week today is, what's the most unusual occupation you've come across in the course of your research? We'll come on to that uh, in a second. And actually, I didn't introduce myself, uh, very remiss of me. Uh, my name is Rose, very savoury warden, uh, and I work in digitising our um, records. So all the records that come onto the site, but probably have a hand in those. So let's see who we've got um, joining us today. We've got Andrea. Hello, Andrea, from a cold Stoke-on-Trent. It has been bitterly cold, hasn't it? Um, we've got Kim, we've got uh, Andrew, dry in Lancashire. That's good to see. Uh, Sally, again, everyone's been <laughs> feeling the cold, but at least there's some sunshine there in Oxford. Oh, hi, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm making my debut today. I'm so excited to be joining you all. Um, so uh, let's, let's, go on, let's get on to um, our uh, new records of the week. Uh, we start off with the 1860 slave schedule uh, browse. So this has been released to mark uh, Black History Month in the US. Now this was part of the uh, 1860 census. Uh, that was the eighth census to be taken um, from uh, in the United States. So what this uh, record set provides is a list of uh, enslaved peoples alongside the names of their enslavers. So what you see in this record set is descriptions of these enslaved peoples instead of their names. So you get their age uh, and their gender. And there's also uh, columns um, for uh, disabilities. This is an immensely harrowing set, but it is a very important set. Um, and it's key to uh, uncovering the stories of enslaved peoples and their enslavers uh, before the American Civil War. So, this was the last census of its type before the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862. So the 1860 census is the last US census where slavery was legal. So top tip uh, for continuing your research, if you're, if you're using this, uh, this particularly moving um, set for your research, have a look at the 18, 1870 US census, and you can use that um, to track the story of your previously enslaved ancestors and um, how they rebuilt their lives. Just see, we've got more people joining us. Um, welcome to Daphne. Uh, welcome to Robin from Toronto. We've got Jane, um, Peter, Victoria. Welcome to you all. Uh, so we'll have a look at our next uh, new record uh, set of the week, which is uh, the Norfolk Monumental Inscriptions, 1600s to the 1900s. So those with Norfolk ancestors, you've been quite spoiled recently. Uh, this is a, another a fantastic set, as you can see here. So this set will contain um, all uh, the details contained on the original memorial uh, of uh, any of the um, Norfolk ancestors. So you might get the birth year, you might even be lucky enough to find um, your uh, ancestor's birth date, which is especially uh, useful if you're looking in the, the 1700s or early 1800s, we don't often find that. Uh, so that could be a real bonus. And some, some of the, these memorials are uh, especially moving. Uh, we can see this one. Um, this one stood out to me. This is uh, to, the, to the memory of Thomas Trett, the beloved husband of Elizabeth Trett, who departed this life March 21st, 1884, aged 92 years, for 50 years a widower and 52 years clerk of Thrigby adjoining this parish. So you get some wonderful information here. Uh, we know that he was a widower for 50 years, so been without um, his spouse for 50 years and he'd been he's been a clerk so he gets his occupation there uh, as well <laughs> and there's quite an interesting quote with this the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the ways of righteousness um 
I'm taking hoary in the sense here of uh, frosty owls, um, using my, my English degree here. If anybody has um, <laughs> any other clues about what that might mean, I'm thinking it's talking about his gray head and his wisdom. <laughs> oh my goodness. We've got minus 26 degrees in uh, Thunder Bay, Canada from Susan. I hope you're staying warm. Oh my word, yes. It, I mean, it's cold here, but about four degrees, we're, we're very lucky. Uh, and I also found this um, this very moving uh, uh, monumental inscription from this new Norfolk collection um, for poor little George William Gorble, who died age six, uh, six years and 10 months. Weep no more for me, my parent dear. I'm not dead, but sleeping here. The debt I paid you all may wait a while and follow me. So really, really moving stuff. And oh yes, I've got I've got confirmation from Andrew there. White hair, hoary head. Thank you for, for that. Um, uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of information that you can actually get from this record set. Uh, there's a real sense of of the loss of um, ancestors. Uh, the real sort of just that emotion around loss uh, and death. So a, a moving set and. This week, uh, we have also <laughs> added 29 uh, new newspaper titles. That's a huge amount of newspaper titles, and I would love to sit here and describe each one of them to you because you will find that I do love my, my newspapers. That That is my one of my main passions uh, in genealogy, uh, for social history. Uh, so we will, we will be looking at uh, newspapers a, a, a bit more um as as we go on today but just to just to cover with with broad strokes the 29 new newspaper titles uh we have uh new newspaper titles from 18 english counties so we're, we're going from we're going from north to south uh this week so from cornwall all the way up to county durham we have not neglected uh, Wales either. We've got uh, newspapers from uh, the north of Wales, the south of Wales. We've even got Scottish newspapers this week too. Uh, and just to throw in a few more, we've got titles from Cambridge, uh, Nottingham, uh, Cheshire, Ellesmere Port. Uh, Ellesmere Port Pioneer is a is a much loved uh, local newspaper. So I, I know there'll be very there'll be some very happy people out there to see that one come onto our site. We've got three newspapers from Lancashire. Uh, we've got Cornwall, Devon, Dover, Surrey. We're, we're really, really, really spoiled uh, for choice this week. And we also have a, a specialist newspaper, which is Distillers, uh, Brewers and Spirit Merchants magazine. We will uh, come back to that. Uh, we, we will um, have a discuss now of uh, our question of the week. So just to remind everybody uh, what the question of the week was, uh, it is, um, I do remember it. <laughs> What's the most unusual occupation you've come across uh, in the course of your research? So just gonna have a look, see, um, see if we've got uh, any any answers to our question of the week. Oh, let's have a look at this one. So this is Georgia. My husband's grandmother was a cigar maker in London from a young age. In 1921 census, she worked for Cohen and Weenan, who also produced cigarette cards. Some still exist today on eBay. Oh, wow, that's a great one. And using the 1921 census as well to find out what your ancestor was doing and to have that ability to purchase them on eBay. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, what else have we, who else have we got? Uh, oh, we've got Nicole here. Um, my three times great grandfather was a traveling saloon proprietor in Wales in the late 1800s till 1902 when he died. A traveling saloon. Wow, that that's a that's a very good one. That's a very good one indeed. So Ellen here, my two times great grandfather was a grainer. He painted wood grain onto things. So the sort of imitation wood grain. These these are very unusual. You, bringing great ones to us today. Um, wonderful stuff. Um, I, I, my, my ancestors are mainly ag labs, mainly ag labs. Nothing wrong with an ag lab, but <laughs> not that unusual. 
Sally, I found an ancestor who was a fodder. I don't actually know what a fodder is. So anybody who knows what a fodder is, please do uh, shout. A uh, good way to, to find out different things from other people, isn't it? Uh, oh, we've got Andrea. Um, my Teuton's great-grandfather was a gland packer on the Great Central Railway in Mexborough. Wow, that's another very interesting one. Andrew, we've got found a marble paper stain and making those lovely end papers for books. Hadn't imagined they were done by hand. Oh, so I know exactly what this is. <laughs> I didn't actually know that was a job. So there's lovely old hardback books inside the covers. You, did you find those the wonderful um, marble paper? Oh, that's that's really that's a really special one there. Um. Daphne's got a good one here, uh, a war artist. Um, that that's an incredible um, occupation. I, I wonder uh, which war um, Daphne's ancestor covered. And we've got Gillian here. Found one ancestor that was a dry stone waller, the only one in the family one Ruth Thatcher and two who were dance and masters and teachers of music. Okay, so you've got you've got sort of the building trade there and then and then the creative side. Oh, that's um that's a really fascinating one as well. And Jen. Hi Jen. <laughs> Good to see you. Um Jen has got a treasurer and trusted advisor to the Stanley tribe of gypsies in Hawaii. Wow, that that wow, that it's trust Jen to come up with with a particularly unusual um, occupation for us there. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we've got Matthew here. Uh, Matthew's third time's great grandfather was a cattle drover in London. Before that, he worked at the Huntley and Palmer biscuit factory in Reading. Oh my goodness, so he lost a hand whilst working there and had it replaced by a hook. So that's that's quite a change. And also to think of cattle droving in London. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm in central London. Um we don't see much cattle here anymore. Uh, but I guess I guess back in the day there were there were many more fields, many more fields. Um <coughs> excuse, <coughs> do excuse me as I choke on my water. <coughs> oh, and then, sorry, <coughs> we are better, <laughs> apologies. Um, so Andrew has direct ancestors, a jacquard maker, a tripe dresser, and a gamekeeper, and a proper one, not just an assistant. So tripe, I can imagine that was maybe quite an unpleasant occupation, if I'm, you know, that, oof. Uh, a bit a bit whiffy that one and a gamekeeper that's 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 wonderfully interesting I wonder what sort of estate um he would have been working on um oh, we've got some great ones coming in thank you everybody uh we've got uh here a golf caddy had a stained glass window dedicated to him at one of the golf courses of Edinburgh that's incredible and to have your ancestor commemorated in such a way that really that really is uh, wonderful uh, we've got some more coming in there from, from Marge thank you on the marriage certificate of my husband's first cousin twice removed his occupation was showman and his father his father's occupation was chief of a tribe haven't had the chance to research any further yet Marg when you do please let us know because this sounds absolutely fascinating um we we love to hear love to hear uh, more about this for sure. Um, Diane, my great granddad was a paper ruler. Not sure what that is. Oh, any ideas about that one? Um, I've heard of um, a paper hanger. So people used to go and hang up um, the 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 handbills and and posters uh but paper ruler maybe it's just maybe it's just how it sounds the ruling of paper who knows um what else have we got uh 
um, another, because we've got quite a few traveling showmans, Nicole, traveling showmen, gun makers, steel workers, even a few um, coal miners. Wow, that, that's a really, really, uh, really, really broad uh, spectrum of um, occupations there. Um, oh, I was hoping we'd have one of these. Louise, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, so she says, my husband's four times great grandpa was the famous rat catcher in 1800s of East Durham in, uh, in Norfolk. So when when I uh, was researching unusual occupations from the past, rat catching uh, came up and there was such a huge uh, necessity for, for rat catching. Uh, just, you know, it was, you know, it might sound unusual to us today as that to be a complete occupation. But if you think about, about the amount of agriculture, uh, they were important, an important part of the community. Uh, I found a wonderful picture of a rat catcher from um, March 1912 in the Daily Mirror and he's described as a very modern rat catcher and the reason why he's a very modern rat catcher is that he had a motor car so this would have been uh, something of an innovation for rat catchers of the time it meant that he could travel around uh, to do his work uh, so let's see if we've got else um, and another um, occupation that I've been really fascinated by uh, unfortunately I don't have uh, any of these in my tree uh, is the knocker up. Uh, the knocker up would go around and wake people up uh, before that, usually their factory shifts. Uh, and it was, it's all, it's a curious thing to me, but who wakes up the knocker up? Who knocks up the knocker upper? And it was, it was a bit of a joke at the time. Uh, I imagine they might just have, have had to stay up all night. Uh, no, I, I mean, it, that's that's a really interesting um, job for the, uh, from the past. Can you imagine not having um, an alarm clock? Um, so thank you, everybody. There's some really fascinating occupations out there. And I wanted to look today about how we can find out a little bit more about occupations. We, we, we see them uh, on census entries and quite often you know, that, that it's all, it's, it's there, written there for us, but what does that mean? What, what, what was, what was your ancestor actually doing as part of that job? And newspapers can be so useful in, in helping us to discover the day to day, what, what your day, what your ancestor's daily life was actually like as, as part of that particular um, profession. So um, we're going to dive in and um, have a look at uh, Find My Past wonderful newspaper collection. I did say um, I love my newspapers, so we're going to, I'm, going to, I'm very happy today to be exploring the uh, newspapers with you. Uh, so before, before we dive in, uh, this is my, um, my great, great, great grandfather, four times great grandfather, uh, Abraham Small. And he's, he's one of the sort of more, uh, and he had one of the more unusual occupations for my family tree. He was a land surveyor. Now, I'm sure uh, you all have those sort of family rumours that are passed down um, from, from, from generation to generation. And this particular small family rumour was that um, my ancestors had uh, the freedom of Dover and Abraham Small lived in Dover. And whilst I haven't been able to establish that, I mean, that would be lovely to have an ancestor recognised in that way. Um, I have been able to find out more about um, Abraham Small uh, and uh, his job. Um, so without further, any further ado, let's uh, dive into uh, the newspaper collection. So in case um, you've not searched our newspapers before, uh, you you can access them by uh, clicking on clicking on search and then navigating to just below the 1921 census to uh, newspapers and periodicals. So we have um, over 48 million newspapers to search uh, across Find My Past. So 48 million uh, pages. You can imagine all the articles on there, everything that you is waiting for you to explore. So how do you search uh, the newspaper collection? So we have this really uh, nifty function on um, the site. Uh, so you can um, 
search by first name and last name. So you can see in the top left hand um, corner, there's the option to put in who. So I've uh, put in uh, Abraham Small there. So once you've uh, performed your search, you can um, filter your search results. Uh, you can see I've highlighted on the left hand side all the various ways in which you can um, uh, narrow your search results. So you can uh, narrow your results by date. So for example, I know that Abraham lived between 1796 and 1850. So I'm going to probably want to uh, keep my search there. Uh, I can also filter by county. So I know that Abraham's based in Kent. So I could maybe choose to uh, filter my results uh, by that. Uh, and we also have our uh, access type. So we also have a million free to view uh, newspaper titles as well. So uh, I can see in my results, I returned uh, 415 articles that matched my search terms of Abraham Small. Uh, and I can... Um, I see immediately that some of them are a bit too early, uh, uh, so probably disregard those ones. Uh, so let's um, have a look. So I decided to um, filter by county. So I, you can do that uh, as counties are listed um, alphabetically. And please, if you have any tips uh, for uh, searching our newspapers, please do uh, uh, let us know. Uh, and as you can see, there was a couple of counties that I could choose from. And you can see also that they include uh, Scottish counties uh, and India as well comes up as an option here. Uh, and just to flag, we, we have a, a wonderful range of international titles uh, from, from India, Pakistan, Australia, South Africa, uh, Jamaica, Antigua, uh, with, with more to come. So we're, we're not just uh, limited to uh, the uh, United Kingdom and Ireland with an our newspaper collection. Uh, oh, wow, I just saw someone saying that, that, that Janice, her great uncle was a ventriloquist. Uh, that's amazing, we've got, some, we've got some more great occupations coming through. Uh, Cindy, her ancestor was a galloping horses proprietor that was owning and running a roundabout carousel at the fairground. We've got a really strong theme today of, of the sort of the showman of the circus. And, and Roxanne, there's a magician in the family tree as well as a drummer boy. So this, this <laughs> maybe everybody's ancestors knew each other, at one point encountered each other at, at, the, at these various uh, showgrounds. How wonderful. So anyway, yeah, back to... Um, the uh, the newspaper results here. So I've clicked on an article about Abraham Small. Uh, this is from the Dover Chronicle on the 12th of September 1840. Uh, the Dover Chronicle is one of our new editions this week and so I was delighted to be able to, to find my ancestor here. So this is what uh, your, uh, when you click through to view an article, this is what it will look like. So you can see the uh, text of the article in which uh, your search results is mentioned is that's highlighted. And there's an also a very useful little blue box around it. Uh, so that, that brings you into where that name is uh, exactly mentioned. And then I'd also like to uh, draw your attention uh, to the, the little symbol on the left hand side. Uh, this this um, is really useful for, for helping you to navigate the newspaper article. So the very bottom, uh, you can press that and that will bring um, the article into, into full screen mode. You can zoom in and out. Uh, and also in, in the very in the very center there at the top, uh, that will help that will, you can reset the page as well. So I, I find that very, very, a very, very useful tool when I'm browsing uh, articles on uh, on our newspaper collection. So what, what information uh, can, can, can the newspapers tell us about um, our ancestors and their occupations? Uh, so we have an article here, which is called um, Perambulating the Boundary. And this gives uh, us a description that uh, Mr. Abraham Small Land Surveyor has been appointed by the council to make a record of the new borough and is in present engaged on that scheme of work. So this is this is really interesting to know who's who's employing um, Abraham, what he's being asked to do. So he, he's doing a, a survey um, of the borough, uh, and so 
and also it's just <laughs> yeah it's it's so fascinating just to know that this is who he's being employed by uh and this was the type of work that he was getting up to and we found i found him in in other uh, newspaper articles as well uh from the the dover telegraph there from 1842 uh, he's appointed to be um, the assessor and presenter of the property and income tax for the parish of buckland and that part of charlton which lies not in the liberty of the town so again, we get a sense of, of the type of um, jobs that he was being given. And he he's, he's seems, seems like he's quite important as well. Uh, also, this link to Buckland. And I know from the census that Buckland is where, where he lived. So he was he was working in the area in which he lived. Uh, so he's, he's not sort of going outside of that area. So not only um, can we uh, get a sense of uh, how our what hands how they were working and, and how they lived and, and what they were up to what their roles entail we also get a notice here of 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 when they died so uh newspapers are uh, a wonderful resource for uh births marriages and deaths so we get here a notice on the 9th of March, uh, 1850, from the Canterbury Journal. So March the 4th at Buckland Dover, Mr. Abraham Small, land surveyor. So this, this is in a, a list, a longer list of all the deaths uh, in the parish. So again, this is very useful if, you, if you're looking for an exact date of death for an ancestor. Also, you do get the, the birth announcements and, and the marriage announcements here. So not only can the newspapers here help me understand how um, my ancestor lived, but I can also get a little bit understanding of, you know, how, how and when he died. But that wasn't it from our Abraham. So I, I did mention before that I, I didn't want to look at dates outside of his his particular, uh, his lifespan. Uh, but I came across this uh, article from uh, 1866, which is 16 years after Abraham um, passed away. And he is being mentioned again. And it's in uh, relation to a parish map that he made in uh, 1844. So they were just going back to have a look at this. There was a trespass case. So the veracity of the map that Abraham Small had made in oof, 20 years before was was being questioned here. So in a way, uh, this was quite, I found this quite moving that there's there's Abraham Small had a legacy in the maps that he created. And it's also an important to, reminder to, for us to sort of think a little bit uh, laterally when we are searching newspapers for our ancestors, even though Abraham died in 1850. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't particularly important. You know, he's not you know, he's not famous or anything, but he is still being mentioned in the newspapers after his death. Uh, so, yeah, it's just that, you know, to, to, to remember not to limit your search and to sort of be open to these possibilities. That's that's always a key a key thing I think when um, we we are uh, using the newspapers for for research. Uh, so I'm going to kind of come into the, the 20th century now, and I, it'd be remiss of me not to mention the 1921 census of England and Wales. It was, it was it's so exciting, I'm still so excited to be able to, to see this. Uh, and I was delighted to find my great great grandfather in, uh, in the census, along with my great grandmother. Uh, so this is uh, Alfred uh, John Small, uh, and he is the grandson of um, Abraham. So he'd, he'd moved out. He was born in Kent. He's born in Ramsgate, but he'd, he'd moved out of um, Kent to Southall in, in the west of London, and he settled there uh, and with uh, and had uh, I think he had five or six children. So he is a, a railway and he was a railway engine driver for Great Western Railway. Uh, so if anybody has any uh, railway worker ancestors, do 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 say we. I have a I have a lot. It's Ag Labs in my tree and uh, Great Western Railway workers. That's sort of key themes for me. Um, so I I did the same thing with. Um, Alfred John Small. Uh, so I followed the same process, uh, searching uh, in using the uh, first name and last name options on our newspaper search page. 
And I didn't limit it geographically this time. I I looked beyond the county in which he lived. Oh, Matthew, lots of railway ancestors, likewise. <laughs> um, and um, I didn't search, yeah, so I didn't limit my search to Middlesex, which is where um, Alfred John lived. And I found this uh, shocking report from the Reading Observer from September 1916. So if you are a bit squeamish, maybe just close your ears for like the next minute or so. It describes a a nasty railway accident in, in the middle of, of the war. Um, uh, the the railway workers that was a protected profession so you you weren't called up if you were working on the railway so we have um Wilfred Palmer who was 18 he was walking along the tracks one night in, in the dark and he was unfortunately uh hit by a train it was a very dark night and unfortunately Wilfred lost his life and driving that train driving that train was my great great grandfather Alfred John Small and um, this newspaper gives his account of the accident and we can see that it gives his address so again newspapers are very useful for for locating our ancestors uh, we see he's at 6 Hamilton Road which is where he is again in 1921 census so again if, if maybe you're having trouble locating um, your ancestors in a census you can maybe try looking in the newspapers to see if they've been mentioned and, and finding an address there which might be able to help you then find them um, in the census oh we've, we do have a lot of um, people here with railway ancestors Victoria uh, Linda uh, Gina um, Roxanne uh, in Ohio, uh, wonderful stuff. Um, so Alfred gives his um, testimony of um, the, the sad accident and it says that he did not know of anything exceptional happening on the way. He saw nobody on the line. So I, I can't imagine how um, shocking this must have must have been for him that he had accidentally um, hit Paul Wilfred Palmer and he, he just had he had no no knowledge. Um, and in the end, uh, he was judged not to be at fault. Um, it, was a, it was a dark night. He was driving in a corners with a signal light. But you can only imagine what an impact um, that had on him. And we spoke, I mentioned earlier about sort of family rumours and what's been passed down over the years. Um, there are lots of stories about this particular branch of my family uh, and none of them, you know, we never heard anything like this. And perhaps this was something that people, they, they didn't want to talk about. But by its very nature, it was it was in the newspaper because there was, there was an inquest, there was an accident. Um, so newspapers are an interesting way of discovering those stories that maybe weren't passed down to you that you didn't you had no idea about so we had we had no idea about this and we had for all the rumors of um uh, having the um freedom of dover and everything else this this kind of very tragic story this was this was never um uh passed passed down to us and we can imagine with these stories and how newspapers give such color to the lives of our ancestors would have no idea um about this particular story without the newspapers and it gives context to what i've heard about my great great grandfather uh, alfred john small he was incidentally very very small but he, he was a very sort of dour man he lived to the age of 96 and maybe um, this experience in 1916 of, of accident, this, this terrible accident, maybe this was what helped to sort of um, shape uh, that, that, that his personality. So I did promise to talk more about newspapers. I mean, we've talked about newspapers <laughs> for the last while or so, but um, you can never have um, too many newspapers. So um, we've been adding some really wonderful newspaper titles over 
the last couple of weeks and what I, the ones that I'm going to be flagging to you today are the ones that uh, concern occupation and it, occupations so we can we have some very um, specific occupation titles uh, in find my past newspaper collection and again these can be so useful to for, for shedding light uh, on on your ancestors' lives, their, their daily lives, uh, the struggles that they might have faced in, in their particular occupations. Uh, so we added last week the uh, Pawnbrokers Gazette. Now this was established in um, 1839. Um, I, I don't know if anybody has any pawnbroking pawn um, ancestors, quite a specific one there. Um, but this particular newspaper um, advocated uh, the interests of Victorian pawnbrokers and the complications of law affecting them. And what is quite unusual about this paper is that sort of instead of focusing on that particular occupation, um, there's a lot of reports of accidents and robberies because pawnbrokers were were, were were targets for criminality because they had all these expensive goods. So this newspaper is uh, filled with um, at reports of uh, robberies, crimes that have affected pawnbrokers. So if, if you have a criminal ancestor, they might be mentioned in here. Uh, again, um, newspapers are, are excellent for, for finding them out about those, uh, those, those ancestors that were sort of up to questionable things. I, I know I've got a few um, who, who were um, uh, fined for, for stealing and uh, and one dist distant cousin, and I say distant, uh, got into trouble for throwing stones at geese, which is very, very shocking. Um, yeah, so I wasn't happy when I found that, but that is that is the newspapers um, for you. Um, so we've got a lot of police intelligence in this kind of uh, in these kind of newspapers, uh, and also accounts of court proceedings, which are particularly interesting um, in how that the pawnbrokers. Uh, uh how in sorry <laughs> um so you can you can find out about their their trials and and their tribulations so you get to you find out the names of um the pawnbreakers and and where they lived so also we've got the bankers circular um this is a, a very historic one so any banking ancestors out there uh and this was um intended to be a general record of all public matters touching the concerns of bankers this was founded in july 1828 and lasted right through until the 1880s so uh, all the banking issues uh, are covered there but let, let's um let's move on to uh something a bit lighter Oh, we've got Brian saying hello uh, over on YouTube from sunny Lang Lincolnshire. And we still have the sun. We do still have the sun. Um, and Robin, she has a cord rainer in her tree. I have some cord rainers too. How very exciting. Um, and actually, uh, what my cord raining ancestor, I only found this out when I moved to London, was actually baptised just down the road from here at St George the Martyr. So the, these connections, you know, they, it's it's a bit uncanny sometimes when when you realise that I'm I'm walking in the same um, in the same footsteps as my great 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 uh, grandfather. So this uh, particular newspaper, the Distillers, Brewers and Spirits magazine, this is brand new this week. And this was published in Glasgow in April 1897. So if you've got anybody involved in the distilling and brewing trade, this, this is a, a fantastic uh, resource. And if you're just interested in whiskey, this is also a great read. Um, you find some fantastic um, adverts for uh, all types of whiskey, both, both Scottish and Irish. Uh, so this, this particular newspaper was a monthly journal devoted to the distilling and brewing industries with um, all sorts of specialist articles, illustrations, adverts, the latest brewing inventions. Uh, and again, again this, is, this is very well, very much, very well illustrated. So it's, it's a very um, interesting newspaper to uh, browse through. And we do have a, another um, uh, brewing title on the archive and we uh, on, on our newspaper collection and this was added uh, several years ago and this is uh, Holmes's Brewing Trade Gazette 
and this was uh, established by a chap called um, Joseph Holmes, and he was a, a brewer's chemist from Leeds. So he was he was something of an entrepreneur. So not only was he uh, producing his gazette, he was producing lots of different um, products, uh, lots of different um, uh, beers. Uh, so. He, he, was, he was quite the character and you can just see this, this wonderful um, front cover here of the, the Brewing Trade Gazette. It's just, it's just, it's just stunning. And this cover, we have this, uh, this newspaper covers the years 1878 to 1886. So the Distillers Magazine came out in um, uh, 1897. So these, between these two, we get quite a good coverage of um, the brewing trade uh, industries. And we have more. We have we have more um, occupation uh, specific titles as well uh, in our newspaper collection. And again, this one is, is slightly um, slightly esoteric, um, slightly unusual, which is the Temporary Postal Workers Gazette. Now, this joined um, our newspaper collection last week, and it was founded in 1988, 1918 to represent temporary postal workers and their association. So around this time, there were well, the this was uh, World War One, so lots of men would be conscripted. So you had you had the postal workers on one side, and you had the temporary ones on another. And these would be drafted in at in busy times uh, like Christmas. Uh, and this was this was the age of the union. There were so many different unions um, and associations, and this was one of them. And this. This was their, their, their special magazine. So you get uh, news of their, their AGMs, uh, correspondence. So a, a great thing about uh, newspapers and these special occupation newspapers is that you have people writing in. Um, you get to know their, their concerns uh, and their worries of the day. Um, so if chances are, if you have any temporary postal workers and you will find if they are there, <laughs> If you, if you see them and find them in the 1921 census, um, they might have been um, reading this um, particular newspaper. Uh, but chances are more likely to have ancestors who were reading uh, the Cotton Factory Times. And this is actually one of my favourite um, titles to be found in our newspaper collection. Uh, so this was um, founded um, in uh, on the 16th of January 1885, and it was the the brainchild of a of one John Andrew who who uh, ran a, another local paper. And so what he wanted to do was when he set up the Cotton Factory Times was to sell more newspapers to workers at the local cotton factories in Lancashire and in Cheshire. So this was really the, the voice of the um, workers in the area. Uh, and the reason why I love uh, looking at this particular newspaper is there are sections like uh, voices from the, the spindle and the loom. There are notes from factories. So this really gives you a uh, vivid um, sense of what daily life was like at the cotton factories, the, the accidents that happened, uh, the dismissals. Uh, I found an example of, of one poor woman who was dismissed for being 15 minutes late. It's just, you know, the, just very vividly it, uh, illustrates the, the hardships of, of life at that time. Uh, and this, and this, uh, the Quantum Factory Times went beyond uh, just, just being the voice of the workers. It was also a source of entertainment. Newspapers were very much sort of in the days before television. It, it was a main source of um, entertainment, and I can compare it to the television because you had you had your news, but you also had your entertainment. So that might be in um, the form of short stories. You would often find. Um, uh, columns called wit and, and wisdom so there'd be little amusing bits uh, snippings from the comic paper so that was really where newspapers were really where you were getting your your weekly digest of news uh, entertainment and what's particularly special about the cotton factory times is that some of these pieces were actually written in the lancashire dialect so to get a sense of how your your ancestors might have spoke and and the things that they might have read it's the cotton factory times i would really recommend uh, having a browse of. And the Cotton Factory Times went on to um, inspire the Yorkshire Factory Times. 
And this was um, published in 1889 uh, in Huddersfield. So we have Cotton Factory Times, Lancashire, a little bit of a <laughs> rivalry here. And um, so this was published in Huddersfield and the Yorkshire Factory Times ended up being a, a lot more socialist than uh, the Cotton Factory Times. Uh, it had notes on lots of different trades. So you can find out all about the dyeing trades, iron trades, uh, wool sorters, um, spinners, so they're more sort of diverse um, than just simply the cotton factories. Uh, and a, 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 an excellent section in this newspaper in this newspaper, excuse me, is echoes from, from mills and, and the workshops. But eventually this did become um, the organ of the textile union. Uh, and in 1919, it became the labor pioneer. And we have um, a loss of trade union and early uh, labor titles as well on the archive. Uh, we'll probably talk about those at some point um, because at, at this time, you know, the, the labor movement is moving into such more of a political force. Um, but the Yorkshire Factory Times didn't keep that name of the labor pioneer. Actually, in 1922, it went back to its original name and it ceased publication in 1926. So we've got two more occupation journals. Um, what could they be? <laughs> uh, so uh, penultimate one is the Setmakers and uh, Stoneworkers Journal. And this was uh, published in Aberdeen from 1891. And this was the um, official organ. That's what I, they used to sort of, newspapers from this time dubbed themselves as the official organ. And I always sort of tended to think of, I don't know, the uh, the, the church organ or, or the sort of heart, <laughs> that kind of organ. Um, but mainly it meant that it was the, you know, the official sort of voice piece, the, the you know, uh, of, of a particular organisation. So this one was for the crafts and trade groups that was connected with stonework and quarrying. And set making, does anybody know what set making is? I had to, I had to, to look this one up. It's quite an unusual one. Um, so set making is actually um, the cutting of quarried stone into rectangular blocks for paving. Hmm, you learn something new every day. And so this particular newspaper looks at uh, these, these trades across uh, Great Britain, a particular emphasis on Scotland, because that's where it was published. Uh, and you can find results of uh, tenders for street paving across Britain. So if, you, if you're interested in the history of pavements, <laughs> This one's for you. And, and finally, I just want to mention the, um, uh, the British miner and general newsman. And this one is part of our uh, free to view collection. And it was a publication that was devoted to the interests of miners in the UK. Uh, this was um, first published in September 1862, and it cost just 2p. And at this time in Britain, there are there were 300,000 miners in the country. And of course, this, this number would go up. Um, and this newspaper was dedicated to um, representing uh, the interests of, of miners. And it came onto the publishing scene promising to uh, record every disaster, uh, every loss of life in the British mining industry. So again, like the, the Factory Times, it's a chronicle of, of the hardships that, that people face in the workplaces. Imagine Victorian workplace, very different to, from today, limited health and safety, lots of accidents. And so these newspapers are an important uh, chronicle of, of those, um, those industrial accidents uh, and the hardships that our ancestors face just just trying to earn a, a decent wage uh, and also this newspaper is great it, for uh, covering uh, strikes uh, and labor unrest again this is the sort of the origins of the the labor and the, the trade unionist movement so you can really trace that uh, through uh, these newspapers and in um, 1866 it became the commonwealth so 
do make sure to keep a lookout uh, on our weekly updates uh, to the newspapers. We are adding more, more titles um, every week um, from across uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, and there's just, there are so many stories out there to discover using our newspapers. And this is just sort of <laughs> the tip of the iceberg, really, um, what I've what I've highlighted today, and if you have a moment to, to browse through some of those uh, those more specific titles, you know, do you can get lost in uh, our newspaper pages. Um, so I'm just going to see. We've got. I know we've had a lot of um, lots of interesting um, uh, um, uh, occupations coming through. Um, we've got Moira here with um, her long line of cord um, That That's wonderful. Yeah, we I, I similarly had have cord in my tree. Uh, it's just fascinating. Um, and oh, Jane, uh, Yorkshire Factory Times, your, her ancestors owned a factory. Oh, wow. So you'll, you'll find that a really um, useful resource. Uh, oh, got some coal trimmers here. So again, the uh, the uh, mining title that I mentioned there, that would definitely um, come in useful. So um, thank you so much um, for joining me on my uh, Friday's live debut today. Um, really um, hope you've um, enjoyed, enjoyed it today and that you've um, learned something. I mean, we've been learning, I've got the difference between cobbles and sets and paving this is <laughs> this is wonderful stuff to learn uh, especially on a friday afternoon so i hope that um everybody has a, a lovely uh weekend and I, I very much look forward to um speaking to you again soon i'm actually going to be doing a talk next week on um the spanish flu and how that impacted uh, england and wales and uh, looking at life after the spanish flu as well so um do uh, make sure to try and catch that and um, I very much look forward to seeing you soon thank you so much bye bye